Okay, so good evening everyone. Thank you for sticking uh, to this uh, late hour. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, concurrency in the C++ uh, uh, memory model. Uh, some of these slides I've stolen from other people, uh, very famous people, so uh, I apologize to them in advance. Hope they don't sue me. So, uh, my name is Pavel. Uh, let's see if uh, this actually uh, works. This uh, my name is Pavel. I'm a developer, trainer, author, and apparently speaker, so speaking. I've written a few books, and uh, they're available on Amazon. Please buy them, and they make me money, so <laughs> go ahead and do it. Um, I'm an MVP, at least for the next uh, three days. I have some courses on plural site, which you can also watch, and that also brings me money, so again, yeah, motivation for you. I have a blog you can read if you don't uh, uh, have trouble sleeping, some people uh, help them actually. I have a few tools on GitHub which you can uh, look at, most related to Windows internals, because I wrote the book, so I have to kind of maintain some uh, facade. But uh, uh, for this session, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, C++ concurrency a little bit and the C++ memory model, which is uh, actually pretty uh, scary. Uh, but uh, hopefully, it will give you some sense or some idea of what's going on uh, in that uh, arena. There have been several sessions of that on various uh, conferences, but I want to give you my uh, take on this. So first, we have several standards today, and we know that we are C++ 17. C++ 20 is kind of coming along pretty quickly. And C++ had that uh, hole between uh, 98 and uh, 2011, where nothing was really uh, going on within the standard, or at least not much. So when C++ 11, 11 came along, then stuff started exploding in all areas of C++. So for example, in C++ 98, uh, the word thread is not mentioned. And so nobody actually wrote threads in C++ uh, 98. We know that. All uh, uh, programs were just single thread. Well, probably not. But every compiler did whatever it wanted to do. There was no standard behavior. There were many various types of libraries like uh, TPP and Boost stuff and OpenMP and whatever uh, to do multi threading in various ways. And now finally in C11, we have the word thread actually uh, represented uh, several times and we have something called the memory model which really describes what are the rules for accessing memory between multiple threads, and what we should expect from these kinds of kind of behavior. And of course, there are enhancements in C++ 14, 17, and 20 in that regard. So, what do you want to do any concurrency? Concurrency is really running some stuff in parallel. Okay? This is basically concurrency, doing things concurrently. So, there are actually basically just two reasons. The first one is to maximize performance. We're in a multicolor area uh, with many CPUs, and uh, there are CPUs that want to leave them out of this session, and so we want to maximize our performance. And people that are writing in C++ typically care about performance at least to some extent. The other reason is just for design purposes. So if you take any reason you, you can think of about uh, why you want to do things concurrently, it will fall in one of these categories. All the other things you can actually put in the second category if you don't care much about performance. Just about how you design your code, how you structure it, and so it gives you some benefits. So we need to design for concurrency. It's not something you want to do later. So, uh, let, uh, run, let me run or write everything in one thread, and, and then we'll add uh, some uh, stuff to do concurrently to make things better. That typically will not work. So you should always design that up front and take the, the appropriate consideration for that because you may introduce a lot of uh, new and subtle bugs which are not sure the zoology and uh, a session previously can actually help you uh, decipher. So we should probably uh, think about this uh, beforehand. So a brief overview of what's going on in the hardware level. So we have today the idea of the socket which has a set of cores and each core sometimes is split into two hyper-threaded uh, threads, which is an uh, Intel technology which also exists on AMD processors and other vendors. So you have uh, several logical threads within the same core, and they are not completely independent. They share some state, especially some uh, levels of caching, as we'll see in a moment. So we have a set of logical processors on the system which we want to utilize as much as possible, at least if we, want to, if we care about performance. So, here's a simple example to kind of start you up. Um, we have a very simple algorithm here, 
which what it does is, uh, you probably guess, it uh, sums up a matrix. So I have a class here called the matrix, so I've written that class, and it has appropriate operators for uh, the index operators, index operators, uh, uh, to get an element in a particular location. And I want to sum these uh, values in two ways. So these are two ways which are essentially the same. And we're just changing, exchanging what were the rows for columns. So we're doing row major uh, summation and then we're doing column major summation. We want to see what's better. And if you uh, studied any computer science, you would say, I mean, that's exactly the same thing. We're doing exactly the same work. I mean, what's the difference? It just seems pointless. But unfortunately, all this stuff related to performance, in many cases, our intuition is blatantly wrong. I mean, just miss the point. You think something that seems to be making sense, but eventually find out the, the reality is completely different. And so in these cases, we always talk uh, about performance first, we need to measure. You, can, you can't uh, predict anything, and even your strongest intuition may be completely wrong. So in this case, it looks like this should be exactly the same, but in fact, it's very much not so. So here's a little benchmark I did on uh, my machine. This is not my machine, I don't go with it no forever, but I did it with this machine. And so, uh, with this particular uh, type of processor, and with the Visual Studio 2017 15.6 compiler, which is fairly recent, and as you can see, I've uh, used some uh, several sites of matrices to, to uh, check this out. One was with RAM, row major, and the other with column major, and I measured the time it took and also the sum of these numbers, just to make sure I'm actually getting the, the correct result, uh, doing the actual the same work. As you can see, the results are the same, but from timing purposes, this is completely different. Row major is, is much faster than a column major. And that's because we have the idea of caches. So caches are really a fundamental part in computer architecture today and the way CPUs work. Because in the distant past, uh, the speed of processors was comparable to that of memory. So it was kind of fun. But Later, we see a lot of uh, digression, and so memory is much, much slower than CPU. And so if the CPU would communicate directly with memory, what we get is CPU stalling almost all the time, and not getting any work done. It's, it's high uh, frequency would be completely uh, wasted. And so we need a cache. The, the purpose of the cache is to provide fast memory for the CPU. So if you can make your needed memory reside mostly in cache, you get better performance. If you have to actually go to memory, you'll get worse performance, and I mean really worse performance. So the idea is you want to utilize the cache as much as possible. So this is what we have in a typical computer system, I mean typical laptop for example. We have several caches. Each cache has a level. Level really means its distance from the processor. The closest to the processor, the, the cache is faster, but smaller. And the numbers we're talking about here are very, very uh, small. And the reason why we got uh, different performance is that because things are, when they are consecutive, contiguous in memory, they can be brought together into the cache, and then the CPU just goes over the cache, which is much, much faster. In the column and major uh, case, we did just kind of jumping to other locations within memory, which we missed the cache, because the cache is small. And then we had to kind of get the data from real memory, which is several times factors slower. And that's why we get these differences, which again, computer science says everything should be exactly the same. So performance is not just about multi-threading or multi codes you need to always look at some other things which are not obvious. In this case, this is cache. So here are some typical sizes for caches. They are really, really small. They are two kilobytes. Do you remember what a kilobyte is anyway? I mean, I don't really know what, what that is. You take a, a telephone, you have uh, more memory than, than I had in all my Congo 64 computers ever. I mean, this is really, really small amount of memory. In fact, the way caches work, they don't work on single bytes. They work on something called a cache line, which is typically 64 bytes in size. So even if you write a single byte, you don't actually write a single byte. The processor is actually going to write more than that. 
what, whether you want it or not. This is just part of the optimizations that uh, the CPU hopes to make depending on your, the code that you write and the way you arrange your, your memory. And so here's another example for you. This is a little bit more tricky. So I'm going to describe what we see here. The idea is very simple. We have an array of numbers. We want to count the number of even numbers in that array. And because this is something we can actually split into multiple threads, we want to do it. We want to split into multiple threads and see if we get, can get better performance by using multiple threads where each thread will take a chunk of the data and then just count its own even numbers in its own chunk and then finally we we'll just uh, sum everything up and see what we get. And so let me describe the code if you haven't seen, uh, seen multi-threading in C11. Let me give you a brief overview here. So we have uh, the function called the count even numbers, that's version 1, and it has the pointer to the array, and the size of the array, and the number of threads we actually want to use, the amount of concurrency we want to introduce into the algorithm. What we do here, I create here an array of numbers which should hold these uh, counts for, uh, that I'm trying to, uh, to do here. So each one represents count provided or updated by a particular thread. And then what we do, we try to create n threads, and each one has a start and end point, which is the chunk that was allocated for that thread. In this case, the last thread gets to uh, kind of uh, get the rest of, of, the, uh, of the, the tail of the chunk that just didn't, uh, wasn't divided uh, properly, which is, of course, not that very important for our purposes. And so I'm creating a thread here. Here's the thread object. And I'm passing in a callable object, in this case, uh, a lambda function. And I'm saying here's you get your, in, your start, your, here's your index in the table of counts, of sums, where you need to put your own sum, which belongs to you, which is part of this array. Here's your starting index, here's your end, ending, end index, and just go for it. And so what we have here is just running over a simple loop and incrementing a, the counter, the appropriate index, if the actual number is in fact even. Very, very simple. And we pass these parameters to the number function and then we just add these to the array, the vector of threads here. We need to do move because a thread is not copyable. You can't just copy a thread. What would, be, what would that mean anyway? That doesn't really compile. So we need to move the ownership from the T object, kind of making it a zombie, and putting it into the vector of threads. And now these threads start executing immediately. Once you create an object, just start executing. And so all what all the main thread needs to do here is just wait for them to finish by calling join on the vector or each thread inside the vector. And once they're done, it's going to just sum up all the uh, parameters that array and then we get the final result of the sum. So this is the idea. And let's see how it fares out. So I try that with from one to eight uh, threads because this machine had uh, eight logical processors, so it kind of makes sense not to use more than eight processors because then would be context switches and contention and stuff like that, and I don't want that uh, to happen. So I used one thread, then two, then three, and counted uh, the, uh, I got the sum and made sure it's exactly the same value, and then how much time it took. And if you look at the results, which may be a bit small for uh, some of you out there, um, we can see that the first thread uh, does the worst, but uh, the performance improves somewhat, and then it starts to get worse. So we're adding more threads, but it starts to get worse, which is really, really weird. We actually expect some form of linear improvement because when each chunk is equal in size, practically, so each thread is doing the same amount of work. So everyone should be working all the time. There's no such case when one thread finishes early, and so there's an empty processor just uh, sitting there. So we should have improvements, but we don't. Anybody knows why? Except that the maybe so many uh, presentation. We're creating what? Threads? No. Why? Why? There's no overhead for that because I'm creating only eight threads at most. That's it. Creation is not that bad. Most of the time is spent. Uh, working that loop. What, what is what the difference between each chunk? Between what? Each chunk, what is its size? 
uh, I don't remember, but big. Right. So, so some of you know all this stuff, probably seen that uh, previously. Uh, they're fighting over the cash. So what we have here is something called force sharing. Because here's what happens. Every thread goes to its own index. So it is a different memory location, so there's no data race here. So there's no problem. The algorithm works. So the standard, uh, one of the promises of the standard is saying if you access different memory locations by different threads, you're okay. Everything should work out just fine. So theoretically, I'm fine. The sums are all correct. But what we have here, because these counters are contiguous in memory, they will typically fall in the same cache line. So once one thread is writing there, it actually invalidates that cache line. So the next one does it and by this cache line is, uh, again. And so we have reads from memory rather than working with the cache alone. And this is really a major uh, bummer in this particular case. And so all we need to do is make a simple change by introducing a local counter for each thread and adding, uh, just incrementing that counter, that local counter, and putting the result in the final index only once. And the results, the results are really uh, improved significantly. Even the single thread case is, is much better now because the, the chance of the same, the, these blockers falling adjacent to one another in memory is really, really slim because they're part of a stack and stacks are typically uh, enough far apart so they don't fall in the same cache line. And so we do get an improvement each time we add more and more threads, which is what we expect. So what we got here was false sharing. We actually were sharing a cache line which we didn't maybe uh, miss them. And so this is again something to, uh, to look at. Again, theory is one thing, reality is different. So this just gives you a sense of what we actually need to deal with generally. And once we are past this uh, sort of introduction, uh, let's go and start discussing the memory model, what, uh, what's going on in C++. So here's a simple example, and the idea here is that I want one thread to, to provide some data and then signal another thread to pick it up, say the data is ready. So thread number two here, this T2 thread, prepares some data, which in this case is just a simple uh, assignment to A, and then signals using this flag that the data is ready. And then uh, the other thread is waiting for this flag to become true. And once it does, it takes the value uh, from A and puts it into B, and that would be the final result. Very, very simple case. Now, what, we be, what do we expect the result to be? Should it be five or maybe zero? And again, if we look in, in uh, computer science and maybe common sense, it should be five. Putting five here, setting the flag, so then the loop uh, is supported, and taking the flag, that's fine. However, that's not really necessarily the case. It may be the case, but may not be the case. In some cases, we get zero. And that's because there are optimizations that the compiler or and or the hardware can make and reorder these two instructions. They are allowed to do it because they're, they're independent. So from the compiler's point of view, and if the compiler doesn't do it, the hardware may do it. And so in some cases, flag would be one immediately and only then A would be five because from the compiler's point of view, the compiler never looks at other threads. It has no idea what to do with that anyway. It only looks at a single thread of execution from its perspective. And so it says maybe it's better to set flag to one because, and, and not talk, when I say compiler, what I really mean is compile everything underneath, which means uh, whatever runtime is there, the hardware, whatever. It doesn't really matter at what point the optimization is applied. It doesn't really matter. We don't care and it doesn't matter for the final result. And so. The hardware may say, hey, I actually accessed flag or something close to flag in the cache line previously, so maybe it's better to, to access it right now and then go to access A because that's in a different location. So this can happen, it happens. 
And so this is something that is called in C++ and C++ standard and generally a data race. A data race is the case where two or more threads access the same memory location where at least one of them is a writer which wants to make changes. Everyone is reading, that's fine. If anyone wants to make changes, then all hell breaks loose. And we need to have a memory model describing what the result should be in these cases. So here are some uh, basic definitions. Question? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. So volatile here actually, uh, volatile is actually different than, uh, it doesn't provide any memory barrier. And um, volatile is something I actually have on my uh, second to last slide before the Q&A. Uh, so we'll probably get to it. Maybe we'll get to it. So I will say that volatile is something that just says to the compiler and hardware, you can never optimize this variable. It's not the same as volatile in Java, for instance, which does mean very good. It's it is unrelated to concurrency at all, because the idea there is that it may be changed from an async operations made by hardware, for instance, that interrupt and stuff like that, and there's no way to know. In fact, even if you have a, a, a code such as, let's say we have a volatile, and I'm saying my volatile equals 1, and then I have something like a equals the volatile, the compiler cannot change that to a equals 1. You cannot do constant propagation. It's, it, it can't do that, because it don't, knows nothing about this variable, and we always read it. The reason I put here volatile is what? Because of that why thing. Because the compiler would say, hey, you're checking flag, you're not doing anything to it in the loop, so I just read it once, and I have uh, an infinite loop here. And so I'm just forcing, in this case, the compiler not to make that optimization. That's the only reason I added volatile here, but it has nothing to do with concurrency at all. And in fact, it is out of the C++ memory model. So, some basic definitions. We have byte, which is probably uh, something you're aware of. Memory location is where objects are stored and everything has a distinct memory location except uh, bit feeds, which are, in case they don't, they don't spread another uh, byte boundary, they have the same address. So, it's something to keep in mind in some cases. We have an independent uh, control flow, which we call a thread, and we have something called a data race, which I just mentioned. Data races are the problematic things in concurrent code. We have multiple threads accessing the same memory, in which at least one of the threads is the writer. So here's another example to show you the problematic stuff. This is a very well-known algorithm uh, from the 60s or something like that, maybe 70s, uh, from Decker. And this is kind of a poor man's uh, critical section. So the idea is that they want a single thread between these two threads to enter some critical region of code where it may be accessing some shared data. So here is one conceptual way to do it. When I want to be the one entering the critical section, I'm setting flag one to one. This is my uh, signifying my intention to enter the critical region. And then I'm checking the other guy's flag. If it's true, it means it said that already I'm going to back off because it's, it, it would be the one entering the critical region. If not, then I'll be uh, continuing into my critical region and my friend there is going to be do the exact opposite. In theory, again, this is something that works. But in practice, it is possible both threads enter the critical region. And there are several reasons for that. One of them is reordering, but even if we disregard reordering, say, hey, that will not be reordered. There's something else in play here, which is something called a store buffer. So the idea here is when we set some value, the CPU doesn't really come running and writes that immediately to memory. That's way too slow. It's going to write it to something called a store buffer and then flash that store buffer asynchronously later without uh, hanging on to, to the processor, the, the processing power, uh, and letting the thread continue on its merry way before even that happens. And so, one flag sets uh, the value 1 to flag 1 in the store buffer. Same goes, for example, in practice this maybe the same time, another processor from flag 2. And when the first thread tries to read the value of flag 2, because these are 
uh, not the same uh, locations, it goes into main network. And so it doesn't see the updated value. Why would it? There's, there's no reason. Nobody told it they're actually uh, needed to be synchronized. We have to do something to make that work because that actually requires the hardware to work harder. And so by default, we just get the value zero for main memory because, again, there's different locations. If we, we are reading, try to read flag one, we'll get the correct value of one because it looks at the store buffer first. But the store buffer doesn't have anything to do with flag two, so it goes to main memory. And so what we get here is just missing the, the point and doesn't work even if there is no reordering in the, uh, in the al original algorithm with flag one and flag two. So that's not good. We need to do something about it. And this is uh, something we aspire to called sequential consistency. Sequential consistency means that the program executes in a set of steps which you can reason about, which you expect, even if multiple threads are involved, and you actually get the behavior you kind of expect to be. However, sequential consistency has a price. And that price is reducing the, uh, the optimizations possible to do by compiler and hardware. So here's an example of what sequential consistency means. Let's say we have two threads, T1 and T2. T1 does A and then does B. T2 does B, C and then does D. So sequential consistency means that all of the combinations are possible between these operations while maintaining order. So for example, this is a legal case. This is a legal case as well. I can reason about it. I know that can happen. This is a, reason, a, a reasonable case as well. And so is this one. And so is this one. However, something like this is not possible in sequential consistent code. Because we have something that is out of order, maybe even running completely concurrently with another thread. So, of course, in practice, this also may run concurrently, but the effects seem like they aren't running concurrently. That's what sequential consistency means. It's something I can read and say, okay, this happened, then this happened, this happened, that's why I got the result that I got. Maybe they did happen at the same time, but the result is something in reason about which has some global order which every thread actually can agree upon. So, this is not sequential consistency. And is this a requirement of the compiler by the standard? I'm getting to that. Uh, actually, the answer is yes and no, uh, which is always a good answer. <laughs> and so we'll uh, dig into details uh, in a moment. But sequential consistency is something that we're kind of used to. On a single thread, it's always sequentially consistent. That's not a problem because the compiler sees all the dependencies. It knows not to do something and reorder stuff that has dependencies on one another. So in a single thread, there's never any issue, you never actually think about it. But in a multi-threaded world where we have caches and store buffers and other weird stuff we're not aware of, this could be an issue because sequential consistency is something that comes at a price. And so the software industry actually tries to settle something a little bit less, uh, less powerful, but good enough for us to work with called SCDRF, which is data race free, which means you can get sequential consistency if you don't have data races. If you have data, you have data races, you're on your own. Good luck with that. But if you don't introduce data races, the compiler and harder guarantee you'll get sequential consistency in those cases. So this is the default memory model in C++ 11. We can change that if you want to make something which is more relaxed, which means we can relax the rules and then move away from a sequential consistency model to something which is much tougher to work with and to reason about, but in some cases can actually be useful. And that's why it actually was introduced into the standard. But the default way the standard works is saying if you work by the rules, which means you don't introduce data races, will guarantee a CDR, which is good. You can, you can reason about it. All you need to do is take care of those pesky data bases. So if you don't make them, you are fine. And what we had previously in the previous examples are exactly data bases, because we were accessing the same memory in multiple threads when at least one of them was a writer. 
So that is something we have to take care of, otherwise we don't get SCDRF, in fact, that's why it fails. That's why decarbonism just fails, because we didn't choose the decarbonism, so all, all, everything is actually uh, can happen. In fact, we get something called undefined behavior, which is the, the best in C++. So the machine can ca catch fire, uh, maybe atomic bomb, uh, anything can happen depending on the uh, mood of the compiler or the hardware, who knows. And so, let's talk about optimization. So the compiler knows everything going on in a single thread. That's never a problem. It never knows what's going on in another thread. It can't really know. And even if it did, it would never know the semantics of shared data between threads. It, it wouldn't know which locks maybe it should take. It has no idea. And so, the only way to actually make these things work is just to tell it. We tell the compiler, look, there's a dependency here, there's a connection that you need to take care of. You need to take that into consideration, do something about it. Maybe by telling the hardware, whatever, but do something about it. So we have to tell it and not do it on its own, as exactly demonstrated by Decker's failed algorithm. So here are examples of some optimizations compilers do. This is a very small uh, amount, of course. So for instance, if you have something like this, the compiler can say, hey, it's just, there's a redundant right here, let's just write x equals 2 and forget about it, I mean, what's the difference? And indeed, in a single thread, there is no difference. It should never be a difference. But in multiple threads, maybe that's different, maybe x is shared. And someone else is expecting the value to change to 1 and do something about it. So it will miss it. And so, in this case, the compiler has no idea, we have to tell it that it's not a good idea, we don't want these uh, this type of optimization. Here's another example. I want to sum up some array, for instance. So let's say Z is a data member of some class. And so the compiler says, hey, that's not a good idea. Accessing Z is really too expensive. What it does is creates a register, puts the value Z in front, and then the loop just increments the register and finally puts the final result into Z. This is a very important optimization. Registers are much, much, much faster than trying to access some index or maybe this z or something like this. And so, again, in this case, we shouldn't care in a single thread. But multiple threads, maybe we do. Maybe that value should change if some other thread is based on it. Maybe it shows the progress of something. That another thread wants to see z actually changing because that's a progress in some progress bar, for instance. But in this case, it miss everything. You just get the initial value and maybe the final value. That's it. So again, compiler has no idea, it tries to do the best it can. Another optimization that could be done is something like uh, reordering of instructions that are unrelated. So we have three assignments here, we can change them in whatever way the compiler sees fit and the hardware. Because maybe, uh, why would you do that? So for example, maybe S3 was accessed really previously, very close to this instruction, so it's still in the cache, maybe it's a good idea to access it again right now first, and then go to other variables. And so, and again, when I say compiler, I really mean everything in the chain down. Even the compiler does reorder, the algorithm may reorder. So again, you can never trust compilers in that regard. And so again, this is perfectly valid. On a single thread, it's valid. Multiple threads, maybe not. So how do you prevent a data race? So data race can be prevented by the following mechanisms. First, if you do read and write as atomic operations, and C++ provides this with the SD atomic class, which I'll discuss in a moment, or we can prove in some way that one of the operations happened before the other. So they're automatically, in this case, kind of in sync, because I can prove this happens first, and this happens next. So here's a simple example for that. Here's a simple data race. We're creating several threads here, which increment a counter, which is just a normal variable. So we have multiple threads, accessing the same data, when at least one of them is right. So in this case, everyone is right. And so we know that in such a scenario, instead of getting a count of, let's say, 500,000, we get something less. Some of those increments will just go away, because this stuff is not uh, properly synchronized or not properly protected. So to do, to make this actually work correctly, all we need to do, which is one of the rules here, is make the variable count as atomic. This 
for this actually caused the compiler to emit special instructions to the hardware saying, hey, that really, is, you can't do anything you want with that. In fact, you can't reorder instructions around an atomic. In this case, you can't reorder anything here. And the operation is atomic. Either it happens or it doesn't, but eventually it's going to happen. It's going to happen fully, and there's no way to look at in the middle and see what's going on in there. So this is actually preventing a data. This is fine. This is fine if it works correctly. So one way to get around data races is really work with atomics. This is also something that can help us and solve, for example, Decker's algorithm to make it work correctly. So atomic operations is an all nothing. This is what I had in my uh, title slide, an atom, which is atom. Okay, so at least uh, as, uh, as the Greece, uh, Greek uh, saw that uh, once. And so we have an atomic operation that cannot be observed by any other thread. This is uh, very important. So if we have a read operation, we get the previous value of the atomic or later value, but nothing in between. We simply can, can't see partial results. On the flip side, the opposite is also true. So non-atomic operations might, might be seen as partial results by other threads. So non-atomic operations really means that not all threads agree on the state of the system, which is really crazy. But this is what non-sequentially consistent consistency really means. That the threads don't have to agree on the same uh, state of memory. I have a question. On the snippet you had in the previous time, one of the cool optimizations that many compilers look for this loop is the Gauss equation. You n plus n times n times n minus 1 divided by 2 instead of the loop. Will it work? And this will work for this number. Will it work for the atomic number? Is no. It, it will won't. insist on the Yes, data. because it may be that another thread is actually counting on this value and wants to read it from time to time. So you can't optimize it like that. So again, the idea of when you have these kinds of things, you, you hinder optimizations. This is the price you pay for continually working with sequential consistent code uh, with when you're free from data races. That's a good question. So what we have in uh, atomic is the class atomic of T. An atomic of T has atomic operations. So all operations are atomic for sure, but none of them are necessarily log-free, which means that some operations can be done log-free, really means that we're not doing locking in software, but only by hardware. And so there's a member function called isLogFree, which is an instance function that says whether your current instance of atomic of something is actually log-free, if you care. So if you want to do some performance measurements, maybe you want to make sure you're working with uh, log-free operations only with atomics. So for instance, when you're working with an integer, it probably will be log-free. Most uh, hardware, all hardware that I know can do these things uh, atomically, not a problem. But if T, for example, is a structure which is larger than uh, the size or the word size of a machine, or badly aligned, then it can't be done atomically on most hardware, and so what we get behind the scenes is a mutex that would uh, protect that structure. So again, the operation is still atomic from our point of view, but it is worth saying that it's something you want to look at to make sure that you get the best performance possible. This is a compile time value? No, it's a runtime value. Uh, in, in that sense. So it, it is compile time in the sense you select a particular type, you say atomic of something, so the priority knows what actually is going to happen because, because it targets a specific architecture. And so it's based on the architecture and the type that you provide. And of course, you can't provide anything you want. You must provide either one of the integral types, uh, pointers, which have partial specialization, add some operators like plus plus and minus minus, and structures which are trivially copyable. They can't have visual functions and stuff like that. You can't do that because uh, this is not allowed for atomic. So here's some uh, details about the member functions of Atomic. So we have assignment, and we have an operator that can return us reading the value of type T. That's easy enough. But we also have the function load the store, which do the exact same thing. So why do these functions exist? That's not because, because some people like functions more than operators. That's not, the, that's not it. But because they actually have an overload accepting a memory order. This is our chance 
to move away from STDRF to something which is more relaxed and allow the hardware to do more optimizations at the risk of making mistakes. And so if you look at every possible talk on, on the web on relaxed atomics, always the presenter says, don't do it, never use it. I'm going to show you what it looks like, but never do it. And so uh, I have to kind of uh, uh, follow suit and say, never do it. Okay, but I'll show you how that looks like. And so we have load and store, we have some other more interesting operations like exchange. Exchange means I can extend some value and without seeing any partial results in between and by any thread in the system. And there are some more interesting operations which are compare exchange, which actually is the basic or the fundamental of log-free programming. And there's the weak and there's the strong version. I'll discuss the difference in a moment. And of course, there's support for plus equals operator and minus equals and all that stuff. And of course, there are functions that are doing that as well, such as fetch add and, and stuff like that. Again, not because operators are bad, but because there's another parameter that is provided there, which is the memory order. And for, uh, for pointers, there are a partial step specialization that allows us uh, to have a plus plus minus minus and stuff like that. So here is the exchange. Uh, type operator. So the first one is, is rather relatively simple. It says exchange, here's a new value for you, giving back the old value, and nobody can see anything in between. That's simple enough. The more interesting is the compare exchange. Compare exchange looks like this, and the way to interpret that is saying that if the value in the atomic is what I expect, here's a new value for you, and return true to me. If the value is not what I expect, then return false, but give me the changed value as well, because notice this is a reference, not a const reference, it's actually being changed, or may be changed by compare exchange. Another way to think about it is that, well, is it me that gets to change the value? If so, I get back a true. If not, how come I didn't, well, I wasn't the one to change the value? Another thread did it, while I was trying to do that. And so maybe I'll try again. And this is something that we typically do in log-free programming, where we try something, it doesn't work, which means another thread did the change before us, so we kind of, let's try again. We typically try it in the loop until it succeeds. It must succeed at some point, because maybe other threads are attacking this same uh, data structure, but eventually they'll be done, and I can move on with my own change. And so we have exchange weak and strong. The difference is just that the weak can actually fail spuriously, not because another thread made the change, but because hardware idiosyncrasy, I mean, hardware is crazy as it is, so it may fail in some, for some mysterious reason, so the simple general rule is if you use it in a loop, always use weak. That allows some hardware to perform some optimization, so it may fail uh, from time to time, but that's fine. It means it returns false. No, no, no. yeah, return it returns false, but not because... Okay. Well, fail in the sense that it returned false, but the value wasn't actually changed by another thread. It returned false just because, because hardware is crazy and nobody understands it. Okay? The strong version guarantees that it will succeed or fail for the right reason. So it failed if another thread actually made a change. But in weak, it can fail just because it failed. So I'm going to try again. So if you use a loop, which in many cases in log programming you do, you should use weak. There's nothing to lose here, really. If you use a simple instruction, then uh, use the strong version, because you must have the correct result. Either it's succeeded or not, but you need to, uh, to base it on, on that uh, operation. So this is, in fact, the fundamental building block in log-free programming, which we'll not get to in this session. So here's something that is very similar to the first uh, case we've seen where we prepare some data, then another thread uh, wants to get the data when it's ready. But this time, this actually works. This works because this time our Boolean is atomic. And so the atomic forces order. By default, it forces an ordering, which means you cannot reorder anything above or below the atomic. This is the default behavior. This gives you sequential consistency something you can reason about. It's not maybe the best performance that's possible, depending on the type of process you're using, but it is something you can reason about. So in this case, 
when ready equals two is here, there's no way to reorder this. The compiler or the hardware cannot reorder it. This is an atomic. This is a store atomic. So this releases also the value, kind of publishes it to the world. And so this uh, waiting here, notice there's no volatile or something here. You can't really write a volatile or an atomic. It's not uh, something that we compile, but you don't need it because the atomic forces you to read the, the real value. And you can see here a pair. This is called release. This is called the choir. I'm acquiring a value. I'm reading a value. And these are something the hardware is aware of. This is part of the hardware. They know these are a pair. If I publish some value, that's because someone else is interested in that. I'm not publishing a value just because. I'm not just incrementing some number and nobody ever looks at it. That's very boring a number. And so if there's a right, there's somewhere to read. And they're always synchronized. The hardware makes, makes sure of that in a sequential consistency consistent case, or SCDRF, which is the case here, which is the default in C++ and C++ memory model. Which means this is something which is easy to understand and easy to reason about. And so, acquire really means something that means I'm reading something, and so things can actually go down, we can actually uh, move instruction down, but not up, we can never change the order. In case of atomic, by default, it's acquire and release, actually. You can't move anything past an atomic in either direction. Release really means publish a value. Anything before that is now visible. So you can't really take it out. You can always you can take in if that uh, pro provides some performance optimization, but you can't take anything out. So this is kind of the direction where the compiler and hardware can move instructions. They can't really move it out of that region. This is, a guy, by the way, the same for mutexes. Mutexes really is a quiet release. And in these cases, you can't move anything out of the critical region, otherwise that would break. But you can move something in, if it makes sense in, for whatever optimization, the hardware thinks it's a good idea. And so, this is kind of uh, repeating what I've said, we have this something called synchronized with, which is a wording from the standard that says, when you write something, this thing synchronizes with that, which means this happens before this. And hence, it's called a happens before uh, relationship. So these terms are part of the standard. They appear in various locations. So you probably should uh, get used to hearing them. So that happens before, and this is synchronized with that. So when there's a write, there's always some read somewhere. Otherwise, the write is useless. And so with this knowledge, we can fix Decker's algorithm pretty easily. All we need to do is make the flags atomic. That's it. Because atomics means reordering is not possible, they're synchronized with relationship. I'm setting this here, I'm reading it here. And so this is a pair, and the hardware, compiler, whoever, ensures this is correct. I will see the updated value, because it looks for that. This is a, a, something the hardware knows about. So this is Decker as, Decker's algorithm in a very simple way, which just works. And so, we get to the idea of relaxed atomics, which I'll go over briefly. So, the first guideline, let me do it. But, let's see how that actually plays out. So, by default, we have memory order, which is called sequentially consistent. Sec CST, which is the default, so we can specify that, it doesn't give you anything. But you can make it a little bit more relaxed. So, what are your options? The first one, which is the exact opposite of sequentially consistent stuff, is called relaxed. What this means is that ordering is not guaranteed. So you're telling to the compiler and hardware, you can reorder as much as you want this particular atomic. However, the operation is still atomic. That never changes. This is all about memory ordering, not about atomicity. Atomicity still remains. But in this case, instructions can go over in either direction when you're working with that. Everything is possible. It means it's the best thing for the hardware. How you can make as many optimizations as you possibly can. So that's great in that regard, but you need to make sure your code can cope with that. Because in this case, what happens, you have an inconsistent state of the world. One thread may see the old value, another thread may see the new value. And that's, that should be fine for you. If you're not fine with that, remove it and go back with sequential consistent case, where everything is kind of what you expect. And so we have relaxed, which is the exact opposite, and we have in between stuff like release, 
which is relevant for store operations because we're releasing something, we're publishing something. The opposite is acquire, which is for load operations, which means I can reorder things down but not up. Okay, so I'm providing partial uh, partial option for the hardware for optimization. It's not completely relaxed, but it is something better than sequential consistency. There's some other weird stuff like consume, which is actually almost the same as acquire. Nobody uses it. No compiler uses it. In C++17, it's deprecated. In C++20, it probably will go away. So let's forget about it. And we have acquire release, which is a bit weird. It's a bit less than sequential consistency, which means acquire and release, but it means uh, you can't reorder one across an inquiry release, but you can move an inquiry release uh, above a different release that is above you. So you have a query release, a query release, this one can move, move here. This can cause deadlocks, depending on the locks that are actually, that actually held there, and so you should never use it in practice unless you really, really know what you're doing. So essentially, you have sequential consistency, relax, release, and acquire. These are the kind of make sense options. So let's see an example. So here's an example. The thing is what I have here is a main thread that launches a bunch of worker threads, maybe n threads. And these threads do some stuff and increment some counter, which is of course atomic. We want to make sure that the count is always correct, or at least yet would be correct eventually. And so uh, can you make it a little, and here we write a reading count when the workers are done. Reading, this is a for John operation, when everything is done, reading count and we're done. So can you make it a little bit more relaxed? And the answer is yes. We can do something like this and say, hey, really, we're not looking at count most of the time. While these threads are running, if other threads look at count, what value will they see? They will see different values. And that's fine. They shouldn't see consistent view memory because this, this is uh, what relaxed means here. So here they'll see always the correct value if they care about it. If we don't care, because in this case all the threads running on this count object, but we only look at it when we're done. And so while these, thre these threads are running, we don't care about the exact value of count. We know that eventually it will be the correct value, because all operations are atomic. But why this happens, we don't necessarily need the exact value at every point in time. This is maybe heavy. And so what we can do is tell the compiler and subsequently the hardware, hey, let's go with relaxed. So this is like adding one, this is fetch add. And let's go with relaxed loader, which means count will be incremented, that's for sure. But the, if other threads would be looking, each one may see a different value. But because no one else is looking at this point in time while this loop uh, is running with all these threads, we don't care. We know that when everything is done, all the threads are done, then the count will have its final value because we're synchronizing with that and reading the value from a single thread. So it must see a consistent view memory because it's the only one looking. So we can go to relax model here. Yeah. As the plus plus count means that you know the stop, doesn't that mean you also read? Right, yes. So right. if you are reading, then you need to... Yes, but this is from the same thread. So for the same thread, that would be always the correct result from that thread's point of view. But from another thread, that's not the case. I mean, this code, yes, another thread will see always the correct value. What I'm saying that is, in this case, we don't really need that. Okay, so, okay, I understand your question. So, the hardware is the one taking care of that. It may postpone the actual store to the count in whatever way it sees fit, if you do something like this, or if you don't look at the value. If you look at the value, it forces the hardware to use synchronize with relationship and make sure you see the correct value. Okay, so from another thing. So maybe there are, so again, it means that the hardware cannot optimize this. It must always see this, the, the correct result at every point, which is not good. And because we don't really care about the value, we can relax it. So there are some use cases for relaxed atomics, but again, you should be very careful when you do something like this. And furthermore, it all, always depends on the actual processor you're running 
In some processors like x86, you actually won't gain anything by that. Because x86 has a very strong sequential, sequential model, which on the one hand is good, on the other hand it's bad because maybe it's missing optimizations it could have had if it supported more relaxed models. So depending on your point of view. In fact, uh, Herb Sutter said that, that the reason relaxed atomics were actually added to the standard is because power processors and ARM v7 processors, which have a very relaxed memory model by default. And so their, uh, their options for optimization are much, uh, much more higher and not optimizing using special consistency is very, is actually causing them to create, to emit a uh, full fans. And so they're kind of reaching out to the end. And so it is very expensive in ARM v7 and power to work with sequential, uh, sequential consistency. So this is for them. He said the half of the reason is power, second half is ARM v7. So without this, in actually the ARM v8 is actually the perfect because it actually provides exact instructions for SCDRF. x86 is too strong. Maybe Intel will do something about it. They actually did with titanium, but titanium didn't work out uh, quite as well as they hoped. So that's another reason why I'm saying don't use it, because if you're running on Intel or uh, ARM V8, you don't really need it. But not everyone is running on these platforms, as we've seen previously with the uh, Android stuff and uh, ARM V7. Just one, one additional note. Remember that uh, the PC will eventually come to ARM very soon. It is already there, in fact. Uh, yes, and so don't expect that your program will forever run on... Uh, on x86. Yes. Uh, Microsoft tried that once, but maybe now it will actually work. Uh, uh, yeah. Apple is trying to do that. Uh, ship to uh, Mac OS to, to ARM. And so everything is open. Don't, don't, don't expect your... I, I don't, uh, I don't, and yeah. I take your, your point. I didn't have any access to So, you mean in this case? Yeah, I'm just reading it as, as brief. All right, uh, so this is kind of explaining uh, these orderings. Let's see maybe another example. So here's Decker's algorithm, and we know that the world works. At least uh, you have to be, take my word for it. So we want to, using atomics, this works. But maybe we can relax it a little bit. So we can say something like this. Because here we're writing something, we want to publish that write. I just need to publish that as a release operation. I don't need the acquire here, really. The acquire is just too much. So I'm saying, okay, this is release. This is I'm reading something, let's go with the acquire. More, more chance, more opportunity for the hardware to optimize, if it can. And again, of course, this is a very simple example, but again, what I'm doing is saying writing is just releasing, so let's just use release. Reading is acquiring, and this, so let's use acquire. And so this is a bit more relaxed. Would actually matter in practice, again, depend on the process of time. Maybe yes, maybe no. But it is something we need to be kind of very careful about. Isn't that the way those functions would be implemented anyway? No. No, because by default that's sequential consistency. You can't no, but why would uh, the bank operator like this, the not operator, be the tougher model? Because it's always only an acquire. It's never a store. How does it know that actually synchronizes differently with another thread? Maybe another thread is actually doing a write, which is important. You can't really know about it. Here it's also the same, but other thread is doing it. But you don't know that the compiler and hardware don't really know that. You can't know that beforehand. So the the, the conservative model is sequential consistency. It says, okay, this is a true atomic. Just do like you do with atomic. No, but you're talking in general. I'm talking about specific operators that are. You always know that the not operator is only a, a load. It's never. Yeah. Right. But, but again, maybe some stuff is happening between these. Maybe you don't want things to be reordered. Not sure. Maybe in this particular case, the compiler is smart and say, hey, maybe there is nothing here. Maybe I will emit a release and acquire a memory order as an optimization. 
So it can happen, but the standard doesn't mandate that or, or expect that to happen. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, so I, I'll just keep the double check locking algorithm, which is interesting, but again, it was actually broken in, in today's systems, in, in the original way it was presented, because reordering and stuff like that, and because there's, there's the, the data is in me. You're actually reading a value, and then you're writing a value from a different thread, perhaps. That's a data risk that can't really work. And so we can fix that in various ways, using atomics, for example, or using data initialization, uh, or uh, using something like uh, call once in C++ 11, or the simplest idea, just uh, do this. Um, so this works, and the standard mandates that work. Behind the scenes uses call once, but it doesn't really matter. The standard mandates that this would work, and the single thread will be able to initialize the object, and there's a single object of that type, and in this case, and, and that's it. That will happen the first time this function is called. But so, cutting is also cost you because it is thread safe, so you pay for the safetyness of stacking. Right, but you pay very little, so it's not like taking a mutex or using mutex, which you always can use for double for for the idea of protecting some data, but that's not it. So you you're paying something for sure, but the, the idea is that you need it because many threads call this function and they want to get the single instance. If you don't need it, forget about it. Create it once when you know there's a single thread running, and forget about all these things. So this is in many cases theoretical more than something else. So, uh, not to discuss fences, just to show you the, the price or the cost of these things in, in various processors. So we can see here, for instance, that in x86, the normal move versus the SC atomic move are exactly the same. So on the one hand, you say, wow, great, I'm not paying extra price. On the other hand, maybe some performance on the floor that you're not picking up. So depending on your perspective. Another thing to note is that reads are more important than writes, because there are many more reads than writes. So for writes, we, we expect to pay some more penalty, and we're fine with that. But reads really have to be fast. And so uh, for power, for instance, the normal read is low instruction. That's fine. But for a synchronization atomic read, what we get here is the full barrier, which is bad. It's really bad. For every read, that's bad. And again, that's the first reason, relax it on this So we can go to this load and hope that this makes sense in our application. And stores are also costly. There are also many references for that, but again, this is, we care less about that. We're, uh, we're fine with, with uh, getting some penalty for, for stores. So on IS64, it's actually not too bad. The loads are not too bad. There's special instruction for that. So they know how to do something which is optimized, not the, uh, Something which doesn't require full fans. For store, do require full fans. RMB7, again, we have that DMB thing. This is the data memory, memory rarity. This is very costly. And this is the second reason this exists. On RMV8, that's exactly right. We have special instructions just for load acquire and for store release. Exactly what we need, uh, without extra memory fences just <laughs> being there. And so this is something to kind of summarize that, uh, from Herb Sutter. So this is what it looks like. So the idea is that the memory model for x86 is too strong. So we're paying more than we maybe we could have paid less. And that's why relax really doesn't make sense for x86 because it's the same thing. Mostly it's the same thing. For, uh, for power, notice, and RMB7, they have, they have a very weak model. And so if we try to do SC, you have to jump to the fence. Which means you pay a lot of penalty. That's why relaxed can help in this analysis. And V8 seems to nail it just right in SCDR. It says we don't make data races, I'm going to give you exactly what we need and don't pay any extra price uh, for, for doing things with atomics uh, versus something which is more. So this is the general idea. And uh, this is uh, my kind of uh, final slide on volatile saying this is out of the memory model. It has nothing to do with memory model, it has nothing to do with concurrency, it just means you can do, you can know, you know nothing about this variable, you always have to read it like it was never read before. And even if you write something to that variable, and you read it back, it may be a different value, so you have to read it back. Question. Sure. 
Uh, so volatile and uh, is guaranteed not to be read from cash. Exactly. Right? So in many cases, in many cases, if I know that compiler optimization does not uh, produce uh, the problem for me, volatile is essentially enough uh, to avoid uh, uh, you know, trade yeah. cons consumer... Uh, Maybe, depending on the type of variable, it doesn't, it's not going to, to be I'm atomic. I'm sure that's correct. If volatile is just uh, so the compiler won't optimize, and, and like what you said... The harder... The no, harder no, 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 you can't. Be anything special. Because volatile is usually used for uh, embedded systems, for example, where the hardware knows that this address is not really a memory address, uh, but an I.O. Uh, register, I.O. register or something. So in this case, it won't go to cache because there is no cache. But I don't think it emits uh, any special instruction to the... I'm not saying it's emitting anything. I'm just I saying it cannot be optimized. optimized. And many people actually show that no compiler actually does volatile similarly or correctly. Well, that's not going to be used unless, like, like as I said, you're in a very particular embedded system and the hardware knows that this address is special. So try avoiding all the volatile. Volatile. I'm not guaranteed that uh, the thread, uh, two threads will also see the same value. You're not guaranteed because every time you read it, it may be different. No. So you're not you're not guaranteed to do anything. It's not guaranteed. So it's like reading from an IO port. You may read it once, you read it a millisecond later, maybe a different pattern, no, for whatever reason. Exactly. I'm thinking about the same, very same, uh, very same moment. What, what, is, what is the same moment? Who knows what that really means? Uh, well, I have no idea. Uh, probably it is the idea you don't know, probably. so you, you can't really rely on anything. Uh, okay. In any case, it's nothing to do with concurrency. Okay. So I'm done with concurrency. Thank you. Thank you.